Yeah. Good afternoon. Good evening to everybody. Thank you for joining this uh, webinar on the India's election outcomes, uh, implication for the future. Uh, thank you, Daniele Figeri, who is here, is the director and president of CESPI. I am uh, the coordinator of the newly established Observatory on India, and this is our second uh, event we have organized. And um, we have the pleasure to have a lot of experts here and you uh, listening. So um, we, we know the results of the election. They have been uh, uh, made public a few days ago. I have three uh, takeaways um, from, from my point of view, but of course there can be, uh, there may be different nuances. One is that the opposition's parties have done better than expected. The second is that the BPS will have to set up a coalition government. And the third one is that uh, uh, if things go in this direction, it will be the third term for Modi as Prime Minister of India. So um, as uh, um, uh, Rugaram Rajan uh, writes in his uh, recent books, Breaking the Mold, uh, the question is, where is India going today? Um, and we are three uh, sets, I mean, area of interest. The first one is we, we, we would like to understand what kind of governance and political risk uh, will, uh, will develop uh, with the new political uh, landscape and how the tension between democracy and authoritarianism will evolve. Uh, this is a phenomenon not only specific to India, but many countries in, U in Europe as well have our experiences experiencing this tension. The second, uh, the second interest is on the um, development of the economy and in particular, of course, of the economic policies of the new government. So what will happen to the investments in infrastructure that have been one, one of the uh, characteristics of the Modi government? What is going to happen to employment that still remain uh, uh, largely in agriculture and informal? What will happen with the uh, uh, international openness of the economy? We know that India has uh, one of the highest tariff, import tariff in the world. What will happen with the financial imbalances the, between deficits? And more broadly, and, but not uh, um, this important, the social development of the country. So gender equity, that is still uh, a big issue. Uh, despite uh, progress in the last uh, decades. What will happen with innovation? What will happen in inequality that remain, remain a, big, a big issue? How the government will deal with climate change? We haven't talked much about it. Also, one of the first paper, the only paper published so far in the observatory deals with this. And as I said, it's not been a big issue in the electoral campaign, but it is a very important issue being India, the largest country and one of the largest emissioners of, uh, of uh, gas. So we we'll have to envision education. Um, economist and Rajan uh, stressed the, important, the importance of uh, this for the development of the country and what will happen with healthcare. Again, despite the uh, enormous progress that has been achieved in the past. And the third uh, area of interest is, of course, the role of India in the world. And in this uh, framework, what will be the development of uh, the relationship between India and Europe and Italy. So we have seen India asserting uh, and promoting the global south. Uh, we have seen the tension with China, 
uh, we have we uh, are interested in what can be developed in what the Italian call the enlarged Mediterranean. So the uh, the uh, the present foreign minister of uh, minister of foreign affairs. Uh, Jai Shankar uh, mentioned cultivate Europe. What that what this means? What is can mean in the future in the development of the relations between the, the India and the Europe region? So uh, the the this webinar is organized in this way. We will have two uh, introduction by uh, two Indian guests. Uh, they will they will have about fifteen minutes each, and then uh, the we will follow with, with uh, short comments and questions raised by uh, Italian experts that are that have kindly accepted to uh, to participate. So I will uh, first give the floor to Parshita Singh, who is uh, advisor at the Frank Guarini Institute. She's also worked in the office of Raul Gandhi, um, has published uh, uh, several papers, some of them on, on Italy and the relationship between India and Italy. One on the Italian Biennio Rosso, that is very interesting. Uh, and um, she has studied at the University of Perugia and speaks Italian very well. Uh, also, the webinar will be uh, carried out in English. She's also been uh, appointed Cavaliere della Repubblica, who is uh, an honorary, honorary title provided by the Italian President of the Republic. So, Patti, please, the floor, the floor is yours. Prati. <laughs> oh. Thank you. That's all right. The name is difficult even for Indians. It's a very, it's a bit of a tongue twister. It's all right. No, it's all right. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here and to be talking about uh, such a significant uh, election um, in Indian politics. Uh, we have really not seen any election that has been like this. Uh, the uh, election itself, the election campaign and the election um, presented many challenges for um, for the the Congress party because I mean considering I'll talk a lot about what how it was viewed from their side but I'll also um, try to give I are you able to hear me properly yeah okay okay there's some message yeah. anyhow so um, considering uh, uh, I mean I'd, I'd be talking a little bit about the struggles that uh, the Congress party and the other um, opposition parties have been facing and how the election then panned out. And then we will um, go a little bit into the results uh, of the elections. So um, as we know that this was like after two terms of Modi government, this uh, 2024 election was going to be a very important and decisive election in terms of the direction that India would be taking, uh, India as a country would be taking in the coming uh, years, uh, you know, how it will be geared towards the future. So uh, it was a very important election for which uh, all parties, all opposition parties had already started thinking about right after the 2019 victory, because the 2019 victory was a big, huge victory. And um, it, made everyone sit back and realize what was going on and how, and then of course COVID hit and how things, how the world dynamics also changed. The Congress party uh, faced this election with a lot of, um, uh, I mean, apart from a lot of trouble, a lot of heat from the ED, the CBI, et cetera, against all opposition parties. The Congress party also had to face financial problems because bank accounts were sealed and, it was a very, very financially, very tight budgeted election for us. And uh, we tried, uh, the Congress party tried their level best to um, um, make use of, uh, you know, the goodwill of the people to make, 
we really came up with very innovative ways to save money uh, in elections because in India, uh, because the distances are huge, it's a huge country and election really requires a lot of funding and with the account sealed, it was not the easiest thing. But we uh, managed somehow, we, you know, we appealed, we managed somehow to get some uh, relaxation and, but you know, the accounts essentially still remain frozen. So that, that was one aspect of it. The other aspect was the human aspect of it, the, the public, the social aspect. Uh, so after 2019 uh, elections, which were preceded by a very bad human tragedy, which actually really jolted the country for many years to come, even now people talk about it, was the unfortunate accident that happened in Pulwama, which left many questions unanswered for the public in terms of why was there such a massive lapse of security and things like that. Uh, the human tragedy on the ground was very palpable. The sentiment of, I would not really, I mean, it would be easy to call it resentment. It was not. It was not resentment. It was more grief. It was just deep pain and grief that you saw on the ground, which was motivated not just by loss of lives, but also by the highest unemployment rates that we've ever seen, uh, the, the extremely, uh, extremely unfair manner in which the protesting farmers were treated again and again, how they were actually not allowed to enter a part of the country when India is a free country. Then the occupation of China, about which uh, the government essentially remained tight-lipped and kept on talking about these rounds of talk with talks with China without really telling us, you know, clearly as to why the talks were happening, and then also saying that the talks have failed without really admitting that there has been occup occupation of our land. Uh, then the big blast also came in terms of what happened in Manipur. Uh, with with the riots and how the state was essentially just it became like this mangled like it became one of the more I was I was in Manipur during the riots in 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 complete and absolute uh, riot situations where throughout the, there was this one place the one hotel that was open in the capital city and even there throughout the night it seemed like there were fireworks because there was just so many gunshots happening through the night and uh, so. That also added to it. We felt every time we went, and we went on the ground a lot. We went to all parts of India, a lot of India. So Congress tried to really cover ground in a big way. And everywhere we went, we felt that um, there is a sentiment that is, uh, I mean, I will, I will not really call it anti-Modi, but there was an anti-government sentiment, a sentiment where people were very upset with the government policies. The farmers were upset with the farm laws that they had come out with uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the unemployed youth. Then the younger people who were not getting any jobs were being given this very sad idea of the Agnivir scheme which also really badly backfired because even the people who were selected for it, uh, you know, they were they felt that they got the shorter end of the stick. So they so it was it just became like this. It, it you could feel that in in like you know bits and pieces and patches things all across the country were really falling apart. And uh, in such a time, actually, this the the first yatra, the first um, uh, march on foot that was started by Mr. Gandhi. Um, that that had been in the planning for a really really long time because in India there is a tradition of march of marching for people's rights as a form of protest but also as a form of of um, bringing people together uh, so that idea had been in talks for like more than a decade uh, and and when when this march the first march the Bharat Jodo uh, Yatra that happened. Uh, that on the ground, you know, walking through the length of the country, 4,600 kilometers by foot, 30 kilometers, 25 to 30 kilometers a day by foot, it, it was something that brought you closest to the last man, as close as one can really get, uh, you know, being a politician. Being a politician, we are 
uh, people are mostly more used to uh, doing big public gatherings, big events, where you do see a lot of people, a lot of common people do come to see you, but you don't really get to touch them, you don't get to converse with them. And that kind of really opened the door for us to be able to come close and listen to them, to hear their side of the story. And then, of course, the next Yatra, which was across uh, the, the breadth of the country, the Bharat Jorunyai Yatra, which was not entirely on foot, but even there, you know, the hybrid Yatra, where there, where there was walking, there were boats, there were buses, there was all sorts of things. That, again, gave us that chance to come as close to people as possible. It was a momentum, a phenomena of a dimension that, I mean, I've heard many people say they've not seen it. I've not seen it. I've never even, like, we knew that it'll be something beautiful and huge, but but the dimension, the depth in which uh, that, that, that whole emotion went was something that was absolutely brilliant and a surprise to most of us. Having said that, when the elections happened, we were, uh, and, and the, so what it gave us was apart from giving us the opportunity to connect with the common people and our own party cadres, our own party workers, it also gave the Congress a chance to display its working style, to display itself in some ways to the possible allies. And once we did that uh, in the two yatras, the um, opposition parties, started understanding the Congress or Rahul Gandhi and the working of this sort of new Congress a lot better than it had before. And so they were readier to form an alliance. And, and with the alliance in place and, and the, the finale of the second Yatra happened with all the allies on one platform in Mumbai. And, and you, could feel, you could see the strength and you could hear the confidence and you could feel that you know these are not people who would easily break away because they were not there they were they had all been harassed by by different agencies uh, because uh, in the last 10 years what we have seen is is not just the media being completely taken up by one or two private hands who favor um, the modi government but also a systematic taking over of the institutions where you can see that there is a blatant misuse of the institutions that's been happening. So it was not just the Congress, obviously, the other parties as well had been had been suffering because of that. And, and, and so it gave them a chance, it gave them a reason, a motivation to make sure that they form an alliance and that they stick to it. So the elections happened while the campaign was was very very difficult for various reasons. Um, one one interesting fact is that you know our, the elections happen in such extreme heat in India, which was not the case earlier. You know when when we were little, elections used to happen at a much pleasant time. It was sometime uh, that Pramod Mahajan, the next uh, politician minister, poor thing, he's not alive. He. Um, he, he thought that the Atal Bihari government was doing so well and then suggested that it be pre-pawned. And now we have elections in such horrid weather because in India, it's like temperatures ranging from 42 to 47 to 38, something like that, all across. And, you know, campaigning in that is not easy for anybody, for any party. So it was a struggle there. But apart from that also, um, it was it was humongous because of the of the people who came for our rallies, the people who joined together with India, um, uh, you know, India Alliance uh, members and, and came in huge numbers to show up for support. And constantly we were on the ground talking to people and we were confident, we knew what was going on. Then 1st of June happened, which was the last day of polling. That was the day that I voted in Bihar. Uh, and um, by evening, the uh, uh, exit polls started coming in. And the exit polls were like were, were such a shocker for every for 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 most of us because we because although uh, the Modi uh, government and Mr Modi had been saying uh, about four hundred more than four hundred seats, uh, he also had dropped this particular slogan, you know, sometime during the campaign. And because probably he could see that it would not be more than 400. But when we saw the exit polls and a few of the so-called reliable exit poll pollsters coming up with, with <coughs> extremely high numbers for the 
for the NDA and the BJP, it was it was of course uh, our common worker was like aggrieved. Our common worker was in shock, and they were calling us. They were talking to us, and I mean I can't say that I was also not saddened. I was a part of. I mean I was constantly putting up a brave face, telling people that no no no. I saw on the ground. I know what I saw on the ground, and I will go by that. But um, we knew what we saw. For example, what happened in the in in mayoral elections in 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 Punjab, where the counting officer himself was, you know, uh, uh, accused of fraud and found guilty of fraud in counting, and he was caught on camera by chance. So one one thinks that oh my god, if such things are possible, then what what can one really trust i don't even want to go into the narrative of the evm but i'm saying that that i was uh, we all felt that oh my god you know we thought that we we've always maintained because you have to cling to a few beliefs you know with all your life and so you feel that you know some things are sacrosanct and you know elections and counting and voting that is not possible to manipulate should never be manipulated and when we saw it on camera that those visuals i mean i can still see the face of that man in my head uh that kind of like kept on playing in everybody's head oh my god what if you know even those who completely trusted the evms the one the uh, there were quite a few leaders who were absolutely sure of the success who were like mr gandhi was unwavering absolutely he was like you know no this is where we are we are doing good and we've been on the ground and we know it and then the results now the results have obviously been an incredible display of of strength of the indian democracy so the fight that the congress was putting up <clears throat> was a fight to save the constitution and to save the idea of democracy as we know it as best as we could and even uh, with whatever people say that you know we have lost the elections but um, we have really we know that we are in a place now where the where, where democracy is in a very good solid space uh, there's something there, there's you know there's a concept called <clears throat> uh it's called i think it's called falling forward and winning failing forward and winning backward so it's 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 that it's that classical case of failing forward and winning backward it means that uh, even though we have seemingly say we have failed to form the government for now by conventional standards but it has actually moved us closer to the goal of of safeguarding uh, the the nation's core values uh, that that was exactly our idea and also now with the kind of allies that uh, i mean modi ji has the lowest winning margin one of the among the lowest winning margins ever in the history of india uh, and he stands now on a pedestal much 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 lower than what he had thought initially now in his in his uh, first speech after uh, election results he also uh, never used the word modi government he used the word nda government and you could see that you know his body language his his mannerisms had changed there is victory of course i mean no doubt and good luck to him with that kind of victory honestly because he has now uh, mr chandra babu naidu he has now nitish kumar and he has allies that he has to rely on he has allies that he has to keep happy and so uh, it it is not going to be easy because mr modi is not exactly known for his flexible nature so there there we have it that's that's more or less the picture that we see uh, today is an interesting day because till yesterday till this morning we had 90 congress had 99 seats but as of this evening we have 100 seats because um, an independent uh, uh, elected member has joined the congress party this afternoon and so uh, the congress has touched the 100 mark but uh, it's actually i mean i personally don't even enjoy numbers these numbers that much i really enjoy the space that we are in and i and the the messages all across the people all across the people on the street maybe went to a few places and i met a, quite a few people uh, not just in delhi but outside delhi as well in haryana as well as in uttar pradesh and people are jubilant people are happy people uh are not uh, i mean people are in a space where they feel that they are not afraid to express themselves people uh, somebody took a video of a person saying that um, hindus are also nice and muslims are also nice but today i can say it 
uh, you know, something which I probably would have thought 20 times before talking to a journalist about it. So these are, these are you know, it's seemingly small things, but things that make big difference. And uh, this is where we are at. And I think I'll uh, uh, leave the floor now. And then we will, when we have a discussion, maybe that's when we can talk again. Thank you, Prati. Very, very interesting. So basically, we are saying for the governance, democracy will last strong, but there, there may be some political instability because the government has now to rely on a coalition yeah. or allies. I mean, opposition will be able to have a role, which it essentially, it is, it is, uh, there is no democracy without opposition. And that's what we had so far. Now we, ha we will have an opposition. Thank you so much. So now the floor to Subash Agraval, who is a political analyst, founder and editor of India Focus, uh, which is a political risk consultancy that advise foreign investors. He studied at Georgetown University, lived in the US for some time, write for newspaper, uh, including La Stampa. Uh, so Subash, the floor is yours. Yours. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. First, I, uh, I want to appreciate uh, everybody uh, here who's present here and listening here because I realize uh, if it were not for me, this uh, webinar would have been conducted in Italian. Pratishta is absolutely fluent in Italian. And I'm probably the only one who's not. So I really appreciate everybody speaking in English. I'll try to speak slowly, not my usual fast English that most Indians tend to speak. But in case I don't, please correct me and stop me and message me if, I, if you can't hear me properly or don't understand what I'm saying. Uh, I've known Michele for many years now. I think it's almost 30 years, Professor Michele Tori. We've done work together. We have been, um, he's uh, interviewed me for his books. I've written for his think tanks. I've reviewed his books. I have a personal and professional interest in Italy. I've been coming to Italy for almost what 40 years now. I first came to Italy in 1984, I think exactly 40 years ago as a backpacker when I was studying in the US and it's been 40 years now. Um, uh, so I'm very delighted to be here. I mean, given the, uh, given the, um, uh, just one second, this it's asking me speaking language. Okay. So um, I'm delighted to be here and discuss this. Um, I, uh, it's, it's very difficult to come in after Pratishta. I mean, she's really covered the base so well, and she comes from, uh, she's had a ringside view, which I cannot claim at all. I am an armchair analyst, and as armchair analysts go, the margin of error in what I'm going to say is plus minus 100%. So I speak with that caveat and that sense of uh, um, uh, disclosure. I um, I think uh, Pratishta started, explained the whole process very well, uh, both as a voter and as a, as a Congress uh, insider. Uh, the election was very long. It was held in the wrong time, in the wrong months over seven long phases, it was just very long. And that's probably one of the reasons why we had uh, a low voter turnout and also one of the reasons why the BJP did not perform as it's expected. My general comments about the elections in India generally before I start to 2024 is that I just want to say that, and this is something worth celebrating since we are celebrating, we're not celebrating, we are discussing Indian democracy, Indian elections, that every time India votes, no matter who wins, whether Mr. Rahul Gandhi's party or Mr. Modi's party, X, Y, Z, every time India goes to the polls, whether in May or June, it's the largest peaceful transfer of power in global history. The number of voters goes up every year, every election cycle. This time it was close to the number of voters was almost 950 million, about 600 and over six, between 665 million people came out to vote roughly 67%, 66%. Uh, as, voluntary, as voluntary election score, in terms of the fact that you're not obliged to vote as a citizen, in some countries you are, otherwise it's a criminal offense. India is one of the high, highest turn, voter turnouts. So elections are taken very, very seriously, both by, especially by the rural people, especially by the poor. The base of the pyramid, the people at the base of the pyramid realize that this is their one time in five years to exercise their power, to exercise their franchise, to tell the politicians, both 
at all levels what they want, what they don't want, what they think, what they like, what they don't like. So it's a real, it's a real big event. And that's why you will see through media pages, through television channels, social media, and other general banners and festivities, et cetera, in the cities you've come to, uh, any of, to India during election time, that it's really like a big celebration. In fact, sometimes it's very difficult to make out whether it's a movie set or a wedding or it's uh, uh, or a, or a, or a election, you know, everything looks very similar. Now, having said that, I want to say that elections in general, politics in general, and elections in particular in India, have this strange alchemy which nobody quite understands, even Indians. I've been doing this for 35 years, and I barely have a grip on what drives people to vote. I wish I knew, I wish, and I don't think political parties may claim they know, but I have a feeling they really don't. They have some idea, but not really. Most Indians are, I mean, Indian elections are particularly very, very impossible to predict because of the complexity. So many things are involved. It's a multi-layered society. India exists at, at multiple levels at, at the same time. Uh, the 21st century coexists with the 18th, 19th century, et cetera, et cetera. So no the democracy comes close to the complexities India has. And that's why it's very difficult for people inside the system, the political parties, the workers, cadres, people who, media people, journalists who talk to politicians who are on the phone, or even exit pollsters, et cetera, get it right. And exit and opinion polls have been notoriously wrong for the last 30 years that I've been tracking. While the trackers, these trackers track voter opinions, I've been tracking exit and opinion polls for 30 years since I started this in 1994. And I can tell you that I can't think of any year when they came close. Sometimes their mistakes ca cancel each other out and they sort of come close, but that closes also at least 10, 15% of their prediction. This year is no different. They were totally off the mark. Forget opinion polls, exit polls also. So everything matters, the reality, the perception, the narrative, money. Pratishtha talked about the fact that you need money in campaigning. Money, leadership, incumbency, anti-incumbency, whether you have an incumbency advantage or an anti-incumbency disadvantage. Alliances, who are your alliance partners? How much, uh, what do they bring to the table? Social factors, caste equations, you know, all of all things are involved, regional factors, religious factors, election management, booth management. So it's a very complex thing. So having this is this is this is on the circumstances, the larger back picture, background picture in which elections were are held in India in 2024 was held. We all know the results to BJP 240, down from 303 in 2019, down from and down to from 282 in 2014, uh, Congress 99 seats, handsomely up from 44 in 2014 and 52 in 2019. NDA gets 296 and uh, India Alliance gets 234. Uh, the key points that I feel is that it's a very interesting result. A lot of memes floating around in, uh, in India. I'm sure Pratishta has also got many of those. I certainly have. The victor feels like de feels defeated and the defeated feels victorious. I was very happy to hear Pratishta talk about how she sees this as a revalidation of their of their idea of India. Of uh, I, I disagree, but I'm very happy that the Congress view is very positive on this. I think that um, there has been a one-sided, sort of one-sided Western narrative, both pre and post election. Uh, Sometimes it's uh, it's intentional, but sometimes it's just lazy journalism. I think it's just borrowed wisdom, not really reporting. Living in an echo chamber, somebody borrows, you know, the New York Times writes something, then uh, somebody in London picks it up, and then somebody in in uh, Rome and uh, Turin picks it up. So it's you know it's 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 been done before. It's that's always been the case. India doesn't get specialized, sui generis treatment from the global press, except maybe the Anglo-American press. I personally believe that there is no mandate against Modi, Mr. Modi and the BJP. There was no anger against Mr. Modi and Mr. and the BJP. And uh, despite all the narrative that uh, we are now reading in the Western press and some parts of the Indian press that um, Modi has been defeated, his uh, he has been uh, his uh, his uh, Hindutva campaign has been. Uh, 
relegated uh, to the sides, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that may well be. People may not have liked the Hindutva campaign. Uh, but I don't think there was any mandate against Mr. Modi. Let's be very clear. That's my very. That's my feeling. There was no anger. There was no wave. Uh, and I come to the reason why BJP performed so relatively poorly. I mean, at the end of the day, if uh, the Congress feels that Mr. Modi has no mandate to vote or to govern, then I'd like to remind the Congress party that BJP alone has more seats than the whole India Alliance and also larger vote share. I mean, that should tell you. So, I mean, are they trying to disenfranchise the people who voted for the BJP? Democracy works both ways. It works for everybody, not just for you, but also for your opponent. The biggest shock for uh, BJP is clearly in, U in Uttar Pradesh. Had it not been for Uttar Pradesh, they would have been in a comfortable, they would, they perhaps still would not have reached their halfway mark, but they would not have been where they are today. Uh, they would have been closer to 260, maybe 265, even 270 seats. And I think um, that has been their the real surprise. It surprised everybody. I, this result has surprised, uh, according to me, it surprised the BJP, maybe other, some of the other people were expecting it. It surprised analysts of all sides, anti-BJP analysts, pro-BJP analysts. Uh, and the biggest shock was the UP. And of course, they've done very poorly also in the two bigger states of Bengal and Maharashtra. But I think big UP remains a sui generis. And of course, in UP, there have been very symbolic defeats. I mean, in Amethi, uh, Smriti Rani, a very firebrand, feisty, almost aggressive uh, BJP politician has been uh, defeated by Mr. Rahul Gandhi's uh, one-time political secretary or um, cadre of, um, officer. Uh, that's that's a very humbling defeat. Mr. Modi's uh, win himself itself in Varanasi has come down from five and a half lakhs to I think a lakh and a half. Somebody please correct me if my figures are wrong, but I'm using very rough figures. There's so many figures coming at us from all over the place. So please do correct me if my figures are egregiously wrong. So Mr. Modi's own uh, victory margin has come down dramatically. That, uh, and uh, then of course, Fezabad, the town where Ayodhya, the Ram Temple is, uh, they've lost it. They've lost the seat in Fezabad, they've lost the seat in Sitapur, which is next door to it. So these are symbolic defeats. Uh, there is no doubt, there is no, no matter how you cut it, the BJP leadership, BJP is one, it's coming back. It's not one, but it's, it's coming back as a coalition. The mandate is clearly much more for the NDA than it is for India Alliance. There's no doubt about that. But BJP leadership in particular has been brought down a few no notches. And I think that's that's probably healthy. I totally agree with uh, Pratishta there. I think that's probably healthy. They were getting a bit too boot, big for their boots. And having said that, I still want to say that Mr. Modi, at a personal level, in terms of his own personal appeal, in terms of a can-do prime minister, decisive, et cetera, et cetera, remains popular. The word authoritarian is hardly ever used or in his, I mean, it's very, it's often used by the Western media. It's always used by the Western media. He's a dictator, he's fascist, he's authoritarian. Authoritarian is probably the most politest version that people use about Mr. Modi, but survey after survey, and I, I would uh, encourage you to read uh, Tavleen Singh, who's probably one of the most longest standing, most credible political analysts in India today. She is highly anti-Modi. And she says she went around villages in India, nobody finds him authoritarian and nobody finds him corrupt. So these are the key election takeaways. One of the, and I'll now come to the reasons why I think BJP performed less than expected. They should have, in my view, they should have hit 270 to 290, not more than that. 240 surprised me. Three, 350, 400 were fanciful figures dreamt in some fantasy land of Mr. Shah and Mr. Modi. We don't know why and how they got, so we don't want to get into that. It was never going to be. But 270 to 290, maybe even 300 was what we were expecting. Most people that I know, most people that I trust, most people that I share conversations with, whose judgment I respect, who've been doing this for a long, long time, who've seen election cycles come and go over the last 25 years. Uh, so there has clearly been huge underperformance. Not huge, but there's been clearly been underperformance. And I think the there are five or six reasons. First, I already mentioned the timing. I think Patishta referred to this very well. The timing, the heat, the duration, the seven phases. I mean, it just dragged on and on and on. And anti-incumbency had to kick in. People got tired of seeing Mr. Modi on the screen and on social media and just saying the same old thing again and again. It went against him, actually. He lost his charisma. There was no charisma to Mr. Modi. People, I know people who are even strongly pro-Modi were just saying, oh, no, not again. So at the end of the campaign, it just, you know, two and a half months couldn't take it anymore. 
Second, I think this is very important and people haven't analyzed this, at least in the foreign press. It is not, nothing to do with Ram Mandir and the rejection of the Hindutva agenda. I strongly believe that. It is actually to do with internal mistakes BJP made. The timing of the election, the long phase of the election, the overexposure of Mr. Modi, total dependence on Mr. Modi and not having a second tier leadership which can carry the water uh, further down the road. Uh, nobody with appeal, nobody with charisma, nobody with articulation. But most importantly, it was also the fact that they allowed in BJP somehow changed in the last two years. It's allowed in defectors of all kinds, from the Congress, from the NCP, from all kinds of regional parties, people they were vehemently against and whom they had filed cases, legal cases against corruption. Ajit Pawar is one, uh, Praful Patel is another example. These are st stalwarts in the Maharashtrian politics. So and B 120 uh, Lok Sabha candidates, the people who got seats from BJP were actually outsiders. They were not part from the BJP family and the RSS family and the Sun Pariva. These were not beholden to Hindutva at any level, but they were given tickets. And the Sangh Parivar was angry, the BJP cadres were angry, RSS was angry, and they didn't cooperate at some level. There was sulking, there was indifference, there was uh, hesitation, uh, they just stayed away. Rural distress, I think in the whole rhetoric of, uh, of India doing so well, and last three years, India has done well. And I'll come to that, both sides, both sides of the picture. The, the, the idea of rural distress got lost. It really, it really has got lost. Even uh, within the urban circles of English language media, even anti-Modi media analysts, and uh, especially in the, I mean, there is rural distress and it was exacerbated, I think as Pratishta referred to it with, with COVID. People who lost their jobs in cities could not find easy to get back on their feet and go back to their old jobs or their old little vending, you know, vends, little small businesses they had, they had a kiosk, they couldn't, they couldn't go back to their lives. There are other reasons for rural distress also, over-reliance on agriculture, which has nothing to do with the BJP, which has nothing to do with Modi, which has nothing to do with COVID, which in fact has huge structural problems. I'll come to that. But rural distress, high unemployment is a genuine problem. And somehow that whole thing got lost in the whole thing about developing India. There's a whole thing in Hindi called Viksit Bharat, which really means developed India, which is a sort of a cheerleading call that India will become a developed nation in the next 15 years. And in the whole thing, uh, rural distress, the whole idea that there are large parts of the of our population suffering got lost. And I think that's this is this is the pushback of the people. Who said, wait a minute, you're not talking about me, you're not talking about us. You are talking about hosting Olympics in 2036, you're talking about a developed nation, you're talking about you're sending uh, satellites to the moon, all very well, but I have no job. My children have no food. So this two-track India that came into play and the anger and anguish, that was a pushback. And I'm glad that there was, because politicians need this wake-up call. Again, uh, I think Pratishta referred to this. Uh, Modi kept talking about uh, about uh, 400 seats. Mr. Modi and Mr. Shah kept talking about 400 seats, and it sounded very arrogant to the voter. I mean, this is their India shining mistake. What Mr. Pramod Mahajan did in 2004 was exactly what they did in 2024. They already assumed what the voter was going to vote in their favor, and that they're going to vote much more. So the arrogance was palpable. I mean, it, it, see, if we were bemused, knowing it's not true, I can well imagine a rural voter who says, wait a minute, you haven't even spoken about my issues. You haven't addressed my issues and you're already imagining that I'm voting for you and in such large numbers that you're going to hit two-thirds majority. I don't care why you want for it. But the sheer arrogance, the sheer presumption, I think really upset. And I think this perhaps will go down as one of the biggest mistakes that the BJP made in this election. The India shining mistake all over again after 20 years, talking about 400. They also got the caste arithmetic wrong because at the end of the day, you can do all wonderful policies, you can create employment, you can raise uh, per capita income, all of that happens, you can control inflation. Uh, but if you don't get the caste arithmetic right, you can't win. And in UP, they didn't get it right. The Dalits, who left Mayawati. Oh, the, these are still early figures, but we are still all analyzing it. It's just been two days. 
but from the data that's coming in, Mayawati didn't get a single seat. She's the Dalit leader of India, of North India at least. And uh, where did her voters go? And there is data to suggest that they went to the Congress and the SP rather than to the BJP. So they didn't woo the Dalit vote, uh, the BJP. And they also got some of the upper caste wrong. Uh, the Jats, particularly in in Western India, were upset. North and West India were upset about the farm agitation, etc. So you know, I'm just talking specifically in terms of UB, but you can do this for each and every state where regional play, regional equations, caste equations come into play. And if you don't get it right, you can lose. So that's the thing. And of course, an anti-incumbency. It had to happen after 10 years. And I just want to remind anybody who listened that this is not the first time it's happened. This is still a re remarkable victory. And I use open parentheses for that air quotes. Mr. Modi has won. He's come back. And he's come back with the diminishing numbers. But this is not the first time. Pandit Nehru also in 62. I'm old enough to... I was, I was a young three-year-old kid in 1962 when Pandit Nehruji... Uh, stood for the third election. He, that was his worst performance. 52 was his good performance. 57 was his best. And 62 was his worst. Exactly what Mr. Modi did. Anti-incumbency kicks in, no matter how charismatic you are, how wonderfully admired you are, what a strong base you are. Anti-incumbency has to kick in. People in India are restless. Things are not going their way. They don't want the same face again and again and again. They're dying for change. It's a young demography they are aspirational, they are restless, et cetera, et cetera. So anti-incumbency has always been there. So that kicked in. So according to me, these are the messages it is... I would, I would not put too much credence at all on the Western narrative that's going around from Chatham House, New York Times. I've also been interviewed for the same stories. That it's a renunciation of the Modi's hateful agenda. If there was any hate, I'm glad there's a renunciation. But I don't think that people have voted against the Mandir, and I don't think people have voted against uh, Article 370, and I don't think people have voted against uh, Agni Veer, and I don't think people have voted against that. I mean, the opposition can try to make all kinds of narrative out of it, and every opposition does. BJP has also made all kinds of fanciful nar narratives and uh, fantasy things about Mr. Gandhi's position on things, but still, neutral analysts like me, it's our job to understand what's happening. So I think it's, it's an internal BJP mismanagement of their timing, of their theme, of their narrative, of their messaging, of their sensibilities towards rural distress, et cetera, et cetera, their caste arithmetic, which reduce their numbers. So that is the reason why BJP underperformed. And the lesson and the whole big takeaway is this, that you can't take the voter for granted. This is wonderful for democracy. I think democracy is one, and I'm very glad that to hear the Congress person say this or that. I would also be glad if the tables were turned for the BJP person to say that. Because all along they've been accusing uh, the election commission. First it was the election voter list, then it was the election voter machinery, then it was uh, CEC, something was always wrong and democracy is in danger and democracy been compromised, et cetera. I'm so glad that they find that democracy has been redeemed with this result. We are all very happy. We can all agree on that. That I don't know how much time we have left, but I have a lot of other things to say about future prognostication about the policy and India's. I specialize in geopolitics, actually. Yeah. So that I, would be that, that, uh, come in to talk about India's relations with Europe. But I think I can hold off for some more after. Let somebody ask questions. Unfortunately, we will not be able to cover everything, and we have many speakers. But for sure, we stay in touch. We will follow up, and uh, you will have uh, a second. Um, uh, a second, at the end, the opportunity to to uh, say something more. Thank, Thank you, you so um, Very rich analysis of the electoral outcome um, and with uh, several issues that you focus that we should keep in mind in our work on the development of the Indian political landscape, the BJP uh, leadership, how they will react to the electoral results, and uh, I think you agreed with uh, Prati on the rural distress that an issue that you uh, uh, you mentioned has uh, been maybe forgotten that now is coming back and that we maybe shape the policies in the next few years. So now we start uh, the uh, the discussion, and we have uh, seven Italian experts, and, but also we have the, maybe the possibility to have an, uh, an expected Indian uh, guest here. 
uh, with uh, her own uh, questions. So basically, um, uh, I would ask uh, uh, our colleagues to uh, raise questions or maybe comment, uh, short comments. Uh, as uh, we, there are seven, eight interventions, we don't have too much time. So I hope we can keep each intervention between three and five minutes. I know, I, I know, but uh, you know, good questions maybe are sometimes better in raising discussion than uh, long, uh, long uh, speeches. So the first one is uh, Elisabetta Basile. She's for professor, full professor at the University La Sapienza in Rome uh, of development economics. She studied India for many, many years. And she's also a member of the steering committee of the Observatory on India. Uh, and she has published many books and papers. Uh, I'm not able to summarize. Uh, Elisabetta, the Three floor minutes. is yours. Yes. Three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, As everybody else. Okay. You have <laughs> my speech because I was thinking to, to talk at least five minutes. So three, three, five. Minutes. three five minutes. Okay. Uh, I I think that uh, I do not uh, agree with the previous speakers. A uh, speaker in the sense that uh, I think that many things changed with these elections. So, and uh, sorry, I can't hear you very well. Can you put the speak the mic next close to you? Yeah, Elisabetta, your mic is a little far. Hello, Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you. Okay. Uh, so I think that uh, two things are going to change in India. And one referred to the international politics, which is not my field. I'm not going to talk about that. The other, what, what I think that is going to change, or it should change, is the development model that has been applied in India so far with, in this, with this government. Uh, my point is that uh, uh, the Modi government has applied in India so far the trickle the, uh, 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 type of development model, which is called the trickle-down development model. The trickle-down development model has been already applied with success by Modi in Gujarat, and there are many books which, shows, which show how it works. I'm not going to, to go inside the model. I want just to mention the fact that the aim of the uh, trickle-down development model is to uh, uh, liberalize the, econ the, econ the economy, to uh, introduce reforms in the organization of the economy. And the reforms have the main, the main aim to attract international capital uh, in order to um, create, uh, induce development in the country. Uh, this is the model that has been applied by Gujarat, by uh, Modi in Gujarat. And I suggested the book by uh, uh, Jaffrey Law, uh, in which this, uh, the Gujarat model is uh, explained in, in detail. The same model has been, in my opinion, applied also to India at large. And uh, of course, in, in the case of India, uh, the model has been uh, adjusted with some social policy, which has been in part inherited from the, piece, the, the previous period, and I refer in particular to the Enrega project program. And other, other programs have been applied by the Modi government in rural areas mainly, with the idea to reduce the, the development deficit, deficit between urban areas and rural areas. Despite the adjustment in the, the trickle-down model that has been uh, obtained in introducing social policies, the model in India uh, uh, didn't work in the sense that uh, the, the country has been moving 
all, all over the period in which uh, uh, Modi has been in charge of the government, and even before, along a, a road to capitalism, which is usually called the low road to capitalism. In, the, in this model in the, of develop, on development, economic growth is uneven in the whole country. Uh, the rate of growth is high, but there, is, uh, the, there are huge in, in disparities in terms of income. There is a wide uh, spread, spreading uh, of uh, informal employment. And th there is an estimate which is currently considered correct uh, of 350 million of put people below the poverty line. I think this estimate is too optimistic in the case of India because uh, uh, always a mistake is done when the estimate of poor people is, uh, is calculated because the, the poverty line which is applied to India is the poverty line for poor countries while India is not anymore a poor country and it, uh, she has a level of, she has to be the, the poverty has to be measured with the, uh, the poverty line, which, which refer, it should refer to uh, middle income countries. So if you use this, uh, a different poverty line, uh, of course, the amount of, of poor people uh, increases very much. Uh, from the economic point of view, uh, India is also uh, failing in uh, uh, exploiting the demographic dividend, which is very important, it should be very important in the case of India, due to the huge number of young people in the country. The, social, the society is unequal and unjust. Uh, there is a strong social segmentation, marginalization of uh, disadvantaged classes, increasing inequality, gender discrimination, and so on. And uh, there is also a huge amount of uh, illiteracy among adults. So the, the recent estimate which I found uh, suggests that uh, about 30% of the Indian population adult uh, is, uh, is um, illiterate. Uh, and also uh, the, the, the research suggests that uh, the, there are still huge educational deficit for children in school, also in primary school. The comparison of India, <laughs> uh, the comparison with other developing countries and emerging countries is very disappointing. I'm not, I've prepared a long list of uh, of publication in publications in which uh, the details of the, the of the situation of India is very clear, the Human Development Report 23-24, uh, the, the, um, the 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 report by the, the by the Modi government on the development on the sustainable development goals is also very clear. In, in, as far as the sustainable development goals are concerned, oh, no, no Indian states have even uh, reached all the sustainable development goals. The vast majority of the states are around 50% in, in, the, in, the, in the street to reach the goals. So the situation is, is very bad. And also another estimate which I found today is the recent uh, multi-dimensional multi poverty index by the Oxford uh, Poverty and Human Development Initiative, which, is, which shows that in India, 17% of the population is in, in condition of very uh, bad poverty, absolute poverty, and the intensity of people living in, in, in poverty is about 40-50%, which means that they have access to half of what they should have. So the, the trickle-down development model has shown to be weak, to, 
to face the situation in India, which is very worrying. And I think that the deep change is necessary. Uh, what could be done and what, is, what are the problems? My question to, to the speaker is, uh, do you uh, think, do you think that there are reasons why the, the Indian population is uh, still su supporting the political leaders which keep the population in India in such a situation? Do you think uh, uh, that uh, it, is, it's, it could be legitimate to ex explain this situation as, um, uh, as a consequence of the ideological use of religion? If it is so, if you agree with me on that, then you have to start thinking that something has to be changed. And what probably has been the, the, out, the, the, the major analysis of what uh, is, uh, has been going on in India, uh, which I found also in several publications in these days, uh, is that most probably the idea, the whole idea of Indutva is in crisis in, at the moment, and the people in, in India uh, is uh, becoming aware that uh, the, the Indutva does not hide the, 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 real, uh, the reality of uh, the underdevelopment in India and the reality of the fact that many people live in condition of poverty which are not legitimate in a, in a, in a country which has such a growing AI rate of growth. That's thank you, thank you, Elizabeth. A very rich analysis. I'm, I'm sorry we have so short time and we will find we'll find, you find uh, so, if, no. the way to circulate and uh, and continue the discussion. So um, the next one is Tommaso Boglio, who is a researcher at the Turin University at the Department of Culture, Politics, and Society. Is uh, uh, in, in working on uh, topic of history of India, mainly three. Can we from... make a small comment, or or we will do it at the end? At the end, yeah, maybe. Oh. Is, uh, maybe we can also cut on the presentations. We are fine. Yeah. And you are, by the way, an associate professor and not a researcher. Anyway, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, just to be, issue, just to be correct, prego. <laughs> so che tu non avresti detto, quindi lo dico io. Tommaso, please. Okay. Um, I will try to be very short. Um, so I will cut all the analysis part, which is anyway too early to my from my point of view to delve too much into uh, deeper analysis on on the vote. But I will take a couple of points uh, uh, on what Prati first and then Subash said. Um, especially the point about the electoral campaign, which I think is one of the key uh, issues about what we saw. Because I agree um, when with Subash uh, Agrawal when he said that it was not a vote against the Hindutva platform. But I think the, the merit for this was more to the Congress and to Rahul Gandhi, basically, because um, we have seen, uh, especially on the part of Modi, an electoral campaign that has been over the top from day one to the end, uh, all based on very aggressive statements uh, against the Muslim communities, against minorities, uh, very threatening, um, starting from the first uh, speech in which he called the Muslims as infiltrators, then going through um, questioning his biological origins and calling himself, um, um, claiming he was sent from God and ending with this very, um, well, I would say interesting from several points of view, uh, staged um, 45 hours meditation. So all throughout these uh, two months, uh, of very aggressive statements. Uh, Rahul Gandhi has stayed very calm and uh, he 
never responded to any of these provocations, but he said uh, his um, political propaganda and political discourses on the issues of basically unemployment and poverty. And I do think that the electorate responded to this. The electorate did trust um, Rahul Gandhi's um, statements and Rahul Gandhi's positioning uh, in the political debate, uh, always taking the arguments to uh, to the economy, to people's poverty, to people's, especially to the lower sectors of society's status in today's India. And this change of attitude was, was to my point of view, very positive. So I was wondering, this just out of curiosity, if the Congress, uh, how the Congress had discussed all this and how Rahul Gandhi with um, his advisors have um have discussed because in the previous electoral campaigns even in state electoral campaigns in gujarat when, when modi was prime minister uh it has always been modi who set the tone of the campaign and all the others all the opponents uh running uh, behind him trying to respond to all his statements this time they adopted a totally different strategy and i think it paid off in a way um so, and this brings me to um, just a couple of questions uh, to cut it shorter. The, the first one, which is somehow related to this point is um, if you can comment both of you a little more on the role of the press during this electoral campaign, uh, because uh, I too agree that the exit polls when they came out were shocking and in a way they exposed uh, once more that the mainstream press in India has been in the past years totally aligned with the government agenda. Uh, and I agree that exit polls um, often are not reliable, but this type of uh, and this level of unreliability has been really shocking. So um, if you can say a little more on the role of the press. And a second question, uh, related more to what happens next, uh, which is directed mainly to Subhash Agrawal, uh, has to do mainly with what's going on inside the BJP uh, and the NDA. Because you rightly pointed out that uh, the BJP gave many seats, 118, if I'm not, if I understood correctly, to um, outsiders and that this um, somehow annoyed the San Parivar. And, and we all know that Modi has many opponents even within the NDA and within the BJP. So now that the electoral results prove that he is weaker than he himself probably thought he would be, uh, what is a possible scenario? Is there any chance that he will be let down internally within the NDA? in the future. So is, is the new government, which is about to be formed, a, a weak government? What do we have to expect? Um, and I had another comment on the international situation, international politics, uh, but I will keep it for later if there is time. So thank you. Thank you, Filippo. Uh, next. Oh, uh, sorry, <laughs> Filippo is the next. <laughs> Filippo Boni is the next. Filippo <laughs> Maso. We're going to take questions together and address them together. Yeah, yeah. So, Filippo is senior lecturer in politics. Can you address what, uh, what Tommaso just asked me? Uh, I think we we need to pull all the answer at the end. Sorry. Okay, okay, okay. So, next is Filippo Bonis, uh, that uh, is a senior lecturer at uh, the Open University in the United Kingdom. Um, and is, uh, uh, if I understand it, published on Sino-Italian relationship. Uh, so, Filippo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And, and, and thanks to both our panelists for the really insightful presentations and the very lively and first-hand accounts of what's been going on during the elections in India. And thanks to, to Chesapeake as well for the opportunity to be here to discuss India's elections. Uh, I'm not an expert on India. 
uh, I've mostly been looking at what's been going on in India from the other side of the border through the lens of China-Pakistan relations. So I've, I've already learned a lot from today's uh, presentation. But so I'll keep my questions um, uh, very brief, and they mostly. I mean, I think it's it's a good time to ask this question because it was the third question that Tomaso wanted to ask. So I'll. Uh, Sorry, Thomas, I'll steal it. Uh, so that's the, uh, it's mostly related to India's foreign policy. Um, and the first question I wanted to ask is the extent to which foreign policy um, has, was an issue during these elections. Because in 2019, there was the Pulwama attack, which, which really sort of generated the rally around, the rally behind the flag kind of sentiment. Um, and, and, and I was wondering to what extent Foreign policy was something which played out uh, in these elections as well, because there, uh, and I'm also asking this because there have been scholars who argued that now the, the distinction between the so-called elites issues and the mass issues and um, has been blurring over the past few years. And with foreign policy being normally an elite issue that, you know, people don't really care a lot about. But I was wondering whether you you would find, you know, people discussing a little bit more about foreign policy or whether that's not happened at all. Uh, and the second part of my question, it's a bit more forward looking. And it was really prompted by some of the, 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 the remarks you made in your presentations and by a, a couple of surveys that have come across. One was in February 2024, uh, India Today's Mood of the Nation poll reported that 19% of survey respondents uh, believed that Modi would be most remembered for, and I'm quoting, raising India's global stature. Um, along similar lines, uh, a year before, the Pew Attitude survey um, uh, reported that nearly seven in 10 Indians believed that their country's global influence was getting stronger. And I think all these points more broadly to this global status aspirations that especially under the Modi leadership, India has sort of made very prominent and has, has expressed. And so my question is, is anything going to change with the coalition government? Will it make it more difficult for uh, the BJP to, to keep pushing this rising power global status narrative or the identity of India as not just the rising power, but as one of the key poles in a multipolar system? Um, or um, are these parties mostly uh, on the same page? And, and, and so we are more likely to see continuity uh, rather than change. So um, I'll, I'll stop my... Um, questions here um, in the interest of time as well, and looking forward to your answers. Thanks again. Thank you, Filippo. So next is Marzia Casolari, if I'm correct, is Associated Professor of Asian History and Institutions at the University of Turin. This is founder of the Institute of Studies on Asia, uh, also in Turin, and author of various books and papers. Marzia, please. Thank you. I, I'm one of the founders of the Institute of Asian Studies uh, in Torino, among other many other colleagues. Uh, okay, so I have just a comment uh, regarding uh, Filippo Boni's uh, presence here. Uh, first of all, thanks. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, a comment about uh, Filippo Boni's presence here that is uh, quite relevant because I think that uh, uh, India's foreign policy is a big issue nowadays uh, after these uh, election results. And the question is, uh, it's not a question, it's a question also, also to Filippo. Uh, the, the India's foreign policy uh, seen from outside and seen from the uh, arch enemy India's arch enemy that is Pakistan. And this question is to both the, you know, our speakers, uh, will uh, uh, India's foreign policy change? Will India's uh, recover uh, its, uh, uh, you know, past tradition, uh, uh, like, you know, past tradition that is connected obviously with non-alignment, but now uh, non-alignment is not anymore in fashion, but uh, India's always had a very, you know, a very, I consider uh, uh, India's, uh, for instance, uh, diplomatic capacity as very high, its capacity to mediate an international crisis. 
um, and, 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 and several other issues that I, I can't mention here for, for reasons of time. Uh, for instance, uh, I wrote also an article on, on, on this uh, uh, um, issue. Uh, we, we know that India's foreign policy in the in the uh, late, I mean, especially uh, during the BJP, um, you know, leadership uh, shifted from uh, uh, it changed its uh, its alliance, its uh, uh, approach to the United States and its allies. Uh, it approached uh, the, um, for instance, the Arab uh, the Arab monarchies, uh, uh, the uh, countries uh, who. Uh, signed the uh, Abrams uh, agreement and so on. So, uh, and also the relationship with China that is very critical and that Pratishta mentioned at the beginning. And this is a question for both of you. Will uh, this, and especially to Pratishta that she has the, you know, the view from inside uh, because she belongs to uh, uh, Rahul Gandhi's, uh, you know, uh, political circle. And she's also a political activist, so uh, she has a she might have a, a vision from inside. So my question is: Will uh, India's foreign policy change? You know, the uh, India's uh, uh, entrance into the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, strategy after after Trump's, uh, you know, during Trump's uh, administration, uh, will uh, India be, uh, uh, you know, uh, continue to be a hardcore opponent of China? Or will it will it adopt a more, uh, you know, flexible uh, attitude towards China? That's the and even and and even to Pakistan because that's a, 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 a Indo Pakistan. Uh, and then uh, I want to connect also with uh, with uh, 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 Elizabeth's. Uh, uh, remarks uh, because you mentioned uh, the uh, the trickle down model that I don't even consider an economic model, by the way. Uh, but anyway, I think we should also mention uh, the you know the uh, uh, decline or uh, of of the I mean the the uh, how can I say the um, reduction or the uh, the reduction of the welfare, the welfare programs uh, in India, starting by by the uh, BJP government, uh, starting from the Narega, that was reduced for from, uh, uh, if my data are correct, from uh, one uh, um, one eighty five of the budget uh, in uh, in uh, twenty fourteen fifteen fixed fiscal year twenty fourteen fifteen to one point thirty three in uh, uh, 2024 uh, and other, you know, almost all uh, welfare uh, programs uh, uh, started or, or implemented by the Congress were reduced in a, in a very, very, uh, you know, meaningful way. So will all these programs uh, will be re-implemented and increased uh, by the, I mean, with the, you know, uh, with this new situation, will be uh, the will the um, uh, opposition this this uh, 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 stronger opposition will be able to influence uh, you know also the welfare uh, policies in India or not? Because according to me, also this is a very uh, a very challenging issue. And finally, I also um, agree with. Uh, Tommaso regarding the, um, uh, I mean, I have a doubt uh, actually um, regarding the, uh, regarding Subash remark uh, that this vote was not against uh, the uh, Indutva policy. I think it was a vote against the Indutva policy, especially if we uh, observe what happened in Varanasi and in Faisabad the constituencies, uh, constituency where we, we would expect uh, after all that, you know, propaganda carried out throughout, so not, not, not just uh, throughout the years, but uh, throughout the decades regarding the Ayodhya issue, the inauguration of the temple uh, uh, and so on. So we, I personally expected that uh, uh, the BJP uh, wouldn't uh, have such a, 
a, a huge setback in Faisabad, but it did actually. And I agree, for instance, with uh, uh, Apurvanan's, uh, um, you know, uh, analysis uh, when he said that people in India uh, voted for uh, those political, you know, actors uh, who uh, um, uh, who um, had a very uh, who presented or supported a very concrete. Uh, electoral uh, electoral and a very concrete electoral agenda so the issue of uh, not, not just of gods uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, birthplace gods uh, birthplaces uh, but uh, but uh, the main issue was uh, uh, the uh, uh, bread and butter is issue poverty how to overcome poverty but not just extreme po uh, poverty but also you know the average uh, a critical economic, a critical condition of the lower middle class. No? And that's a very, very practical issue of bread and butter of, or, of uh, uh, rice and dal, speaking in, in Indian terms. Thank uh, you. Uh, and just, just a last remark, uh, the, the role of youths in voting. Because I, I agree with Apurvanand when he says, uh, when he writes uh, that uh, uh, this was a, a youth's vote. Basically, so uh, and it was a youth a youth vote. Uh, the the unemployment affects especially the youth, and then they most probably had the um, most concrete approach to those to these elections, expecting something concrete and not uh, you know a message regarding gods and goddesses. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Martin. Uh, we have uh, um, also here with us uh, Silvia Costantini, who is the head of the Office uh, for Central and South Asia at the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Economic Cooperation. Uh, she has, among uh, other things, she has been also a member of the EU delegation to India and Bhutan. Silvia, please, would you like to make some? I guess that we, we have really, we're, I think, running out of time, which means, first of all, thank you for organizing this. First And second of all, uh, it's great to be here. Thank you to all. Uh, basically, I'm perhaps uh, going a bit uh, farther um, in respect to what Marta Casolari, which I thank, uh, said uh, with regards to Indian foreign policy. And I'm also interested about your, your views. And I had a long, much longer uh, intervention, but of course, uh, given the time uh, frame, I would cut it, cut it short. When it comes to internal policy, because that's, uh, you know, we have uh, a third consecutive mandate, um, now an alliance one, and uh, what would it happen with the process, reform process, which were already ongoing? Uh, wh what is your view on that after these elections? Thank you. Thank you, Silvia. Uh, so next is Michel Guglielmo, sorry, he's here with us. He is the editor. Cut it. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe the audience, I don't know. They, they is, uh, oh, okay. Michel Guglielmo is well, well known as really is a, 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 an important piece of the observatory, member of the City Farm. Yes. Thank you, Elizabeth. Please. Well, I must say that uh, I've been following Indian general elections uh, since uh, the election of uh, 1989. And uh, I must confess, I have never seen an electoral campaign so filled on the part of a prime minister of so, many, so much hate, of so, uh, so many attacks against the minorities and the, in particular against the, uh, the Muslim minority. And uh, I had never seen uh, such a systematic lies uh, on the part of the prime minister towards the main opposition, opposition party. So um, it, it has been, a, if I may be frank, a very upsetting, and uh, disgusting campaign. But the point is that uh, most analysts, or all analysts, 
we are expecting from this kind of campaign a big victory on the part of Mr. Modi. So Mr. Modi won, but as uh, uh, Subash told us, but the point is that it was a Pyrrhic victory. And we know that the Pyrrhic victories are the uh, starting point towards defeat. So Modi won, but the point is that uh, uh, his victory was uh, a political defeat. Now, why has this happened? Because of this is something that uh, nobody was really expecting. Um, well, India is a very complex country, as many of the other speakers uh, have stressed. So it is uh, very difficult to, to give uh, a clear cut explanation. And, uh, and it is, uh, how to say, um, it is uh, certainly wrong to give a mono casual explanation of what happened. But still, I think we should uh, think about uh, these problems. As uh, Subash has stressed, uh, the epicenter of the difficulties of the BJP in this election was in the, uh, in the North, and uh, particularly in uh, UP. So the problem is why the, uh, the BJP was uh, politically defeated in, uh, in UP. Well, my impression is that uh, um, in UP and in other parts of North India, we had the, uh, the contraposition between a party who was uh, um, carrying his uh, electoral campaign based on uh, uh, religious Hindu-based slogans against uh, parties who, in certain cases, uh, were castle parties, parties uh, that spoke uh, in the name of a certain major caste. Now, um, we know that, uh, particularly in UP, caste-based parties were very important before the rise of the BJP. And uh, there was a period in which uh, the uh, caste-based parties were uh, in eclipse. And uh, now what has happened, what uh, seems to me to have happened, particularly in UP, is that uh, this uh, eclipse has finished and uh, the uh, caste-based uh, parties are on the rise. Now, what does this mean? Um, parties, uh, castal parties, are parties which are really organizing uh, segments of uh, social classes, uh, making use of uh, uh, castal idioms. But the point is that, uh, uh, that these parties uh, represent certain well, well, defined social classes. Now, my question to uh, the, uh, our two Indian friends is, uh, do you agree with this kind of, of analysis? And uh, if you agree with this kind of analysis, uh, um, what do you think that peace means for the future of, of Indian democracy? Thank you, Michele Guglielmo. Of course, very interesting questions. Uh, we have now Elena uh, Valdameri, who is senior researcher, if I'm not, if I'm correct, at the history of the modern world at the Polytechnic of Turin. Uh, she has published several books and articles uh, on colonialism, post-colonialism in Asia, and and on India liberalism. Elena, please, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot for the kind introduction. Thanks for having me and thanks uh, Prati and Subhash for your um, very interesting contribution to the discussion. Um, so I have a difficult task because all important questions have been asked already. So um, my first question will be quite hands-on. 
um, in a way, Prati and Subash, you are saying the same thing, that this was not um, a vote against Indutwai. This Prati, you say this when uh, you reconstruct the voice of the people you met during your um, campaign. I would like you to spend a few words more about this. So can you um, bring to us the subaltern voice of Muslims, for example, that were the very targets of um, the hate speech campaign that um, Professor Tori just mentioned? And if you can also perhaps um, tell us something about women's opinion, because we know that the women constituency was um, is a constituency that Modi has cultivated during the years. And, and using this um, conservative religion religious card until the very end with this narrative of the Mangal Sutra. Mm? Uh, this would be the, uh, the first question. So could you find um, some hints against Indutwa or it was just about um, Modi's incapability of getting the social reality of, of the country? And then, um, Marta, you have already asked um, uh, a question about welfare policies and how they might be um, influenced by the global context. Now, what about the local context and how Naidu and Kumar, if this coalition um, is formed, can influence welfare policies, um, especially towards um, the leads, the, the appalling number of poor people uh, that Elisabetta Basile told us about. And finally, um, considering the control of the media, the huge amount of money that was injected in the electoral campaign, the control of important institutions, the victory of the BJP is not as impressive. Um, and I know, Subash, you might think, um, you might not uh, agree with me in this, um, that this is just a Western conspiracy and laziness of journalists reporting um, each other. But do you think, I'm asking um, both of you, um, with a coalition government that is without a, a dominant single party, will we have more space in the political arena for liberal values, um, religious pluralism, the media will be freer? Uh, what is your take on this? Thanks a lot. Thank you, Elena. So um, we have uh, a very rich set of questions. I would like just to mention that we have uh, here with us uh, Susmita um, Mohanti, who is Director General of Space, Space, Spaceport Surabai, a space uh, think tank, yes. Uh, and uh, so now uh, it's time for the replies. Unfortunately, we don't have much time. We have, have to be strict. So not more than 10 minutes each. Uh, but as, uh, as I said, uh, we will find a way to circulate uh, documents and the continued discussion. So please, uh, Prati, the floor is yours. Okay, um, I will try to reply as best as I can, uh, as much as I remember. I will stop you, don't worry. <laughs> you can always in between tell me that I, I have forgotten something and I need to uh, speak more. So first of all, we I mean, I wanted to really say this, even when Subhash was speaking, was that uh, a Amethi victory, I mean, I, I mean, spectacular as it is, I really want to say uh, there was something misquoted there. Um, Mr. K.L. Sharma, the, the now member of parliament from Amethi, is, uh, was never a secretary to Mr. Rahul Gandhi. He was once a secretary to Mr. Rajiv Gandhi and later uh, the manager of constituency for Mrs. Sonia Gandhi. And uh, so he knows the family. He has never really worked with Mr. Rahul Gandhi. But of course, because it's the family and they've always been together in those two constituencies, they know each other very, very well, but he's, he does not the secretary uh, and a splendid, splendid human being. Uh, well, uh, I wanted to talk about the climate uh, issue that was um, uh, raised by, by Professor Esther Elisabetta. Uh, it is, um, I mean, I, I don't know what their climate policies would be. I have been fortunate enough to be a part of an Italian delegation here in, in India, in Delhi, when there was a, a, a UN convention uh, on um, 
on desertification and and i got a chance to speak to a lot of players uh, you know within the indian uh, polities this was like i don't know four or five years ago or something within the modi government uh, and and i really got to study quite a bit and from what i and i mean if i don't know what their future policy would be really because there is something that is written on paper and what really gets translated is very very different but uh, from um, by mr modi's own admission he said a few years ago that the plant is not getting hotter it's just that we are getting older and so we feel the heat more so uh, that's that's basically that's one of his thoughts about climate change and the other thing is you know a few weeks i actually i, I think 10 days back the temperature in delhi was unbearable it had been unbearable for quite some time and it reached 52 degrees it was hot people were dropping dead like flies if i tell you that you know it's very unfortunate that during this long campaign like subhash was saying it's a very, it's been a very long campaign we've lost around 40 um election uh, personnel you know uh, to heat exhaustion to heat strokes and heat exhaustions but that day when the temperature hit 52 degrees the indian meteorological department immediately the next day said that uh, no no the temperature was not 52 degrees it was probably the same as the other day it's just that probably we have some problem with the thermometer that was recording it so if that is that's the way forward i don't know where climate uh, change and how seriously climate change has been taken um temperature is unfortunately something that that can be and, and other other than that all temperature was coming from that particular meteorological station itself but everything else was acceptable but the day that it said it's 52 they said that it's broke so you can understand so i mean i don't know where to uh, take it forward from there uh, as far as uh, yeah as far as the camp the media is concerned media is a very important question and i really like addressing it i um you know, many people have been commenting since yesterday that there is a change in the tone of media, that all the media houses uh, that have been like, you know, India today, or like all the media houses which who have been venomous towards the opposition have suddenly kind of subdued uh, a little. I don't believe that at all. I don't think there's any reason for them to do that. Uh, see, now to go back to free and fair media in India, it will be a an uphill task in my opinion it's not easy i mean it's, it's it's much easier to manipulate it but to go to roll it back is a very very difficult task so now where we stand with the media it will take a lot of reinforcement from a different government uh, that the media kind of understands that it is allowed to be um, you know a little uh, like much more neutral than what it is now uh, having said that yes with the opposition stronger, one thing is sure to happen is that we will push a lot more for release of of um, uh, you know prisoners which are which have been just like picked up and taken because they said something and they were uh, you know branded anti-national people like Omar Khalid and all that. Yes, and uh, the neutral voices, the voices which have like voices like Ravish Kumar and Ajit, like lots of them who have been also very critical of the Congress and other opposition parties and rightly so, that's their job. Um, they would probably feel much safer in, 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 you know, much, much easier. These people anyway have staked, have put everything at stake and they have been doing it, but it will probably mean something, a, a, a little relaxation for them to be able to function because the opposition will be able to raise questions about it. Now, uh, this is something related to media, which I don't know if you saw today, uh, Mr. Gandhi did a press conference and this is something that we have been talking about for a few days. So there was a systematic way in which uh, Mr. Modi's interviews over the last five, six days, just before the, the exit polls, Mr. Modi and Amit Shah's interviews, they've been asking public very openly and normally to purchase shares. They are saying just go ahead and buy shares because on the fourth, the market will skyrocket. They're them saying basically that go ahead, buy, we'll come back to power and we'll... It's actually, I mean, and then the day of the exit poll, the markets shoot up and there's a very big peak that happens. And right after that, the next day it collapses. So there are more than five uh, crore families which are investing uh, you know in the in the in the stock market in india now they've they've had to go through this really bad sort of scam wherein they actually purchased because what do you do when your prime minister and your home minister is telling you to go ahead purchase it's not their job 
they 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 are saying it on like in their interviews very openly you know to go ahead and purchase and then the market crashes so the loss is theirs of course and and those interviews are all done on the channel of mr adani a person who is being investigated for fraud of the kind so it it is very difficult to now of course uh, the opposition is demanding for a joint parliamentary committee to investigate that which was a dream in the last uh, tenor of mr modi simply because every time we asked for a, a joint parliamentary committee they were like there was basically nobody who came up uh, for the opposition and supported it now we have a stronger opposition so we can actually make it happen so media uh vis-a-vis -vis the strengthening of the opposition that will play out in many ways and you will see it um in a very very tangible very real manner also as far as what subhash said that there is no uh, that the voting did not happen against agnivir etc i'm sorry to say that's not true at all i mean we i'm i have i have dictaphone recordings of people from all across the country and who said that i will never vote for this person because he came up with something like the agnivir it ruined see what it does is it not only gives you a very bad employment possibility a very pathetic you know lacking respect of all kinds not just that but also there are people there are young boys you know who out of a lot of love for their country they want to go into the armed forces they want to take it up as a career it's not just about having a permanent employment yes that's there but there's also that love that's there they've kind of killed all that all those dreams and you know they've really they, there has been it is it is systematically been done and it's it's i think it is very short sighted to think that people have not voted against that people have voted against that and how like in ayodhya what we have seen what has happened it has happened specifically because you made people homeless by creating that temple i when i'm i'm in i can i talk a lot from personal experience and i've been traveling except, so the only indian state that i have not been to again in the last 3 years is tripura apart from that i've been to every state over and over again and i have spoken to people and people have said people have cried and said that you know if he builds a ram temple good for him but i will go and pray inside the temple that i have built in my own house everybody in india has like a tiny little space where they put two little statuettes of ganesha etc and they pray and they think that like you know what is my stake in a temple there and also i was shocked when somebody said this to me that there is no temple like i was talking to somebody at a at a at a tea shop uh, i'll tell you where um, it it was not a meeti but like right outside a meeti we were just about to enter a meeti this man and he said that where are the temples of the birth places of other gods there are no temples of birth places of other gods it's a concept that they've created it's a non concept for hindus why are they doing this so to think that it's not against hindu uh, the hindutva agenda or to think that it has helped in any way just because they gave you know on the 22nd of january when the event happened of the opening the grand inauguration of the temple we were in the second yatra in assam you know the you know how hemanta vishwa sharma as a chief minister is and it was so tight and we were getting we, we got like we got lathi charged by the police every day every single day we got wrong cases which we are still fighting against us but apart from that you could see those uh, saffron flags everywhere but when you spoke to the people they said somebody came to my house and put it here so if you so you have to to inter no no just one last thing that i want to i i mean yeah etc i mean i i have maybe i'll i have a lot more to say but all i want to say is surely one change that will come as a guarantee which has already started because the spokesperson of the jdu uh, on behalf of nitish kumar has already asked the revisiting reviewing and possible scraping of the agnivir scheme and the tdp the the, the chandrababu naidu has asked for a lot of ministries it already shows you a weakened uh, a much 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 weakened government from the nda i will not call it modi government at all it's an nda government and now a much more strengthened and much more enthused opposition ready to take it on thank you thank you prati subhas 
Okay, well, you guys really don't like Modi. I'm, I'll be I'll be happy to walk out of this alive. <laughs> uh, let me take, uh, there's so many questions here, but I want to address, to, I'll come to the foreign policy. I think that's probably very interesting. That's really my area. I'll come to Sylvia and all the other people who ask about what India's foreign policy is going to be. I think that may be something that I will, I certainly will follow that. But I just want to come back to something. I, there's so many questions, so I'm mixing them. Elizabeth Elizabeth asked about uh, about the huge inequality, marginalization of classes, the low social indicator. Absolutely, I mean, but this has nothing to do with the last ten years. This this has been around for seventy years, fifty years of Congress. Do you know the indicators? Do you know what the indicators were? They were worse. Now poverty has actually declined. You mentioned it yourself. Financial Times, United uh, the, uh, the United Nations, BP, World Bank, etc. They've all noticed the fact that. Extreme poverty and poverty both have declined dramatically in the last five years. Not in the first Modi term, by the way. We can use 10 years of Modi as a to bookend it, but actually in the first five years, he did very little genuine reforms and genuine uh, social welfare programs or even private sector programs. It is in the last first five years. The first five years, he really wasted his time. It's in the last five years. So the question people should ask is that what did the Congress do? Why are people still so poor that they require handouts after 75 years of independence. I think that's a question that you should really ask before before just, you know, we need intellectual honesty here. We can't just keep thrashing Modi, keep thrashing Modi, keep thrashing Modi and the BJP. Modi has a lot of problems. I'm not here to defend him, not at all. But so does the Congress and so does uh, the Gandhi family. And I don't want to get into that because that's going to become very uncivilized and I don't, I hate that. But let's understand that. So that's the first thing. Second thing is somebody mentioned that the reduction of welfare programs, I think it's Mar Marzia, you mentioned that. I don't think you know the facts, if I may say so. I don't know if you know that Modi has spent in excess of $400 billion in social welfare program. That is three times what UPA did in their 10 years, in the last 10 years. He hasn't done it in Manrega. Maybe you know, but you know that. And this is the Financial Times report I'm looking at. Not a friend of Modi. This is the, this is the BBC website I just opened. Not a friend of Modi at all. They will tell you that is housing. He's built 110 million uh, let me just tell you, let me give you the facts. He's, he has done, uh, he's, he's built 100 million toilets for poor people, mostly for poor people, urban poor and rural poor. He's, built, he's opened 500 new million accounts. He's given 200 new free insurance, medical health insurance. He's, he's built 40 million economically weaker poor people's homes. The, even Modi's trenchant critics recognize that he has done much more for the base of the pyramid in social welfare schemes. May not be the most intelligent way, may not be the most publicized way, so the international media perhaps and think tankers don't know about it, but he has done much more than the UPA one and UPA did two to, did together. In fact, and he's been able to do this because he managed to raise resources. Spending distribution of income, redistribution of income, spending on the bottom of the base of the pyramid, we all in favor of it. Nobody's opposed to it. Even the most capitalist of people I know wants that the country should be stable, should everybody should ride, all, all boats should rise. So that is like mother and apple pie, nobody and sky or blue sky, nobody's against it. The point is how do you create the resources? How do you generate the resources? BJ, BJP, Modi, a building on, in fact, by the way, and I want to give credit to the Congress governments in the past, building on what Mr. Manmohan Singh has done and building on uh, what Mr. Narsimha Rao has done, they have laid the foundation for a fairly strong private sector starting in 91, which is now generating sales tax, VAT, what we call lot, yeah, what we call GST. Personal income tax has gone up phenomenally in the last 10 years. You are able to generate resources to put it into poor people's social welfare schemes. He's doing both ends. He's generating the resources and he's putting it. I think you really need to revisit Mr. Modi's eye. You may not like him for many other reasons, but at least on this issue, I would strongly urge everybody who thinks that the marginalized classes have been ignored by Mr. Modi to revisit that issue, to look at the facts and look at the facts from anti-Modi voices, not from BJP, not at all. There are lots of reasons to like, not like Modi. I mean, he's He's built up a personality cult. He doesn't listen to reason. He does policy making by ambush. The whole thing about, we can go on and on. But just to analyze Mr. Modi, it would be so unfair to India. This is a thing on India. This is not a thing on BJP or 
or Modi. So let's let's broaden the thing. There's a Congress. The opposition has an important role to play. Congress is the pivot of the opposition, and they've played very irresponsibly. You talk about the hateful speeches. I can give equivalent number of hateful rhetoric of the Congress leaders. I don't want to get into that. That would be very unfair. But it just seemed to me that this suddenly the, the tenor of this whole thing changed, and we went from a well-rounded discourse of understanding what India is to just let's thrash Modi, let's thrash BJP, BJP's hateful. I feel this is not what 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 does demonizing of Modi? I want to ask anybody who can answer. What does demonizing of Modi do for for the world or for the Congress Party? Have, have I, they, have I, they... I want to I want to reply to that. Uh, really, uh, you've been saying. I just wanted to say this one thing. I I don't know about the others. I don't know what they say. I don't hate Modi at all. He's he's an on entity for me. I love India. That's all. I whatever I'm saying here is because is out of my love for India and what one expects from a prime minister. Not not against Modi at all. He's an he's an on entity. I mean, why would I mean Modi now is not Modi. He's a prime minister of the country. He's a prime minister. I'm I'm I'm, I'm criticizing my prime minister. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Prime. Yes. Let me please finish my. I didn't interrupt you. I didn't interrupt you. Please. So if you look at the social, so I mean, this is something very serious. Something is very seriously wrong in this audience if we don't, we are not aware as thinkers, academics, professors, if you're not aware of the huge social welfare spending by Mr. Modi and by the BJP in the last 10 years. You may criticize him, still criticize him. That is fair. Absolutely. I'm not beholden to him. I don't vote for him, but that's not the point. But at least let's get our facts right. We may have our opinions, but let's get our facts right. I'm so surprised at the fact that these things even came up. Manrega, Manrega, he has gone beyond Mandrega, you know? So that's one thing. So I want to now jump away from the controversial issues to the foreign policy. Yeah, foreign policy, what happens to the coalition? Very quickly before foreign policy, Michele, you raised the question about RK caste-based parties coming back. Probably, yes, they were never away, by the way. They were receded into the background in the whole rush of the last 10 years of BJP and all the other things. But the, even within the BJP, there's a very careful nuanced caste calculation. And it's not it's not that hidden. It's not that uh, well hidden either. You can understand it. They play the upper caste versus they they have had uh, successful alliances with Mayavati in the past. Uh, this time they didn't and they suffered. So they also play the caste game. They have to because there's a if you if you just go by the natural caste arithmetic of each party, uh, it's very difficult for BJP to cross that limit which they need to get to 72 on their own. Unless something wonderful, uh, something other things change in the in in, in the ecosystem. So caste-based parties were always there, and they are certainly going to come back in this coalition. Now coming back to foreign policy, yeah, many people asked about it. Sylvia, as an Italian diplomat, I wish I could tell you what I I don't. I don't, the answer is I don't know, but I suspect that India has three or four. Let me answer that. Let me go back a bit, step back a bit before I say I, I don't know or what will change or what will not change. India's foreign policy has three or four circles and orbits. One is security issue, physical security, and that relates to basically terrorism, uh, Pakistan, China, uh, maritime trade routes, etc. So physical security. Second is related to the to keeping uh, economic security. Geo, uh, geoeconomic security, which is basically uh, looking at uh, our um, energy security. Where do we get our oil from? Where do we get our natural gas from? Where are we? How much are we importing? Are the shipping lanes clear? Is the Red Sea open? Can we get the cheapest price for the oil? Where do we get it from? Where, where can we get the cheapest price for the containers? Where do we get it from? Who will insure it? Will it arrive on time, et cetera? Et cetera. So that is the second orbit, if you would like energy security. So first is the physical security, which really concerns mostly the neighborhood, India and the neighborhood. The second is energy security, which concerns the little beyond. And it involves the big players also. It involves uh, America for sure, and Russia and China and others and Japan. And then the third issue is uh, looking at a larger spectrum of just India's emergency world and global engagement for multiple benefits institutional benefits, diasporic benefits, consular benefits, uh, trade, free trade agreement benefits, uh, uh, service, free movement of Indian service professional benefits. Uh, there are all kinds of things that India has concerns with. So if you look at these, these would be the three 
important areas that I, I don't want to prioritize them, but I would say physical security, energy security, and 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 uh, leveraging and uh, uh, capitalizing new opportunities with a very positive global engagement with the world. Now, in the first case, as far as physical security is concerned, I don't think any government, we, whether Mr. Modi's or Mr. Mr. Gaul Gandhi, uh, will compromise or should compromise on that. There may be some tactical mistakes made, but I don't think there will be a firm line when it comes to terror, when it comes to attacks. Pulwama was mentioned. I think had he had any other government been there, they would have treated it perhaps similarly. If not, it would have been uh, a surprise. Let me put it this way. So uh, physical security, I think there is a general consensus that this is how we deal. China is a difficult act. We don't know how to handle China. I must confess, China doesn't know how to handle the USA, and we don't know how to handle China. China is another bully. Yes, I'll just clear. China is another bully for us, like, uh, like, um, uh, but we don't want to get boxed into an anti-China quad or an anti-China Western alliance, which will make life more difficult for us. So we have to tread that balance carefully. The second is energy security. The BJP has done a very good job. I don't think there's going to be any disagreement on that with regard to coalition. And the third is as far as the larger thing is concerned. No, so I don't see many changes, but I see changes in terms of not policy, but in terms of the rhetoric the body language, the larger uh, picture, if you might call those, the soft issues, but in terms of actual priorities, I don't see any changes. Thank you. Thank you, Subhash. So we are uh, at the end. Uh, now I will uh, give the floor to the honorary president of CESPI, uh, Piero Fassini, please. Thank you, thank you very much. I speak Italian. There is a translation. Uh, molto brevemente, anche perché il dibattito ha rivelato che c'è un rapporto diretto tra dimensione demografica dei paesi e lunghezza degli interventi. Quindi, <ride> quindi da questo punto di vista, essendo noi un paese molto più piccolo dell'India, possiamo contenere gli interventi in tempi molto più contenuti. Molte cose sono state dette, io... Naturalmente ho apprezzato molto le analisi che sono state fatte, soprattutto dai nostri esperti amici indiani e dagli altri esperti che si occupano di India nelle nostre università, nei nostri centri studi. Allora, in sintesi, mi pare che queste elezioni segnino indubbiamente un riequilibrio politico in India. Il partito di Modi vince le elezioni, si conferma il primo partito, ma non ha la maggioranza assoluta ha un numero di seggi molto più basso e c'è un, un diciamo, una forte ripresa del partito del congresso, sia pure in questa coalizione India che ha messo insieme molte altre forze politiche. Però non c'è dubbio che c'è un riequilibrio. Il riequilibrio non è soltanto nei numeri, è anche nei territori, perché sono molti i territori nell'India, penso al Punjab, penso al Kerala, penso al West Bengala, che già governati dal partito del congresso hanno visto risultati elettorali significativamente a favore della coalizione india e quindi c'è un riequilibrio che non è soltanto nei, diciamo, nei rapporti di forza tra i partiti politici e anche diciamo, ehm, caratterizzato dalle, diciamo, sul piano territoriale. Questo riequilibrio ha molte conseguenze ovviamente. La prima conseguenza è che a me pare che una parte significativa degli elettori indiani non ha accettato la, diciamo, la strategia di Modi eh, di caratterizzare l'identità indiana come un'identità essenzialmente indù. L'India è un paese multiculturale, multietnico, multireligioso, ha una storia complessa che tutti sappiamo fin da quando ci fu la partizione tra India e Pakistan all'indomani dell'indipendenza, sappiamo la complessità eh, del, 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 diciamo, di, un paese, di un universo indiano, eh, la linea che ha perseguito Modi in questi anni, quella di caratterizzare fortemente eh, l'identità dell'India come un'unità eh, hindu, eh, non è stata premiata dal voto. E questo mi pare che sia un dato politicamente significativo e rilevante. Perché Modi aveva molto scommesso sul riscatto dell'identità indiana rispetto alla storia dell'India. E questo riscatto non è premiato dal voto. 
e, e credo che questo sia un dato importante perché consente all'India di mantenere quel profilo di democrazia eh, pluralista, eh, multietnica, multiculturale, multireligiosa, che è fondamentale per la garantire la dinamica, le dinamiche democratiche di questo, di questo paese. Un'altra un conseguenza del riequilibrio è che Modi non ha i numeri per cambiare la Costituzione e questa è un'altra conseguenza significativa perché proprio perché Modi aveva questo approccio fortemente induista, se avesse, avuto, avesse ottenuto una maggioranza in grado di cambiare la Costituzione l'avrebbe molto piegata in questa direzione e invece il fatto che non abbia la maggioranza dei voti eh, dei seggi in Parlamento fa sì che questo rischio sia in qualche modo eh, contenuto eh, ci sono naturalmente altre, altre conseguenze eh, intanto sul piano internazionale eh, Modi ha caratterizzato molto la sua proiezione sugli scenari internazionali con l'ambizione di affermare l'India come una potenza globale, come un grande player politico della globalizzazione. Lo abbiamo visto quando l'India ha presieduto eh, il G20, lo abbiamo visto nello sforzo di allargare eh, l'alleanza la, diciamo, dei BRICS, eh, nella proiezione che l'India ha cercato e cerca di sviluppare come potenza globale, non c'è dubbio che questo, che è un'ambizione che in realtà non è solo di Modi, è un'ambizione di tutte le leadership indiane, anche, anche precedenti, tuttavia subisce in qualche modo una, un ridimensionamento. Cioè, quindi sì, l'India è un grande player del mondo della globalizzazione, tuttavia diciamo, l'esito elettorale, eh, secondo me, ridimensiona diciamo, l'ambizione di Modi. Eh, soprattutto alla luce del fatto che poi l'India si muove in uno scacchiere internazionale particolarmente delicato. L'India è parte dell'alleanza Quad insieme eh, agli Stati Uniti, all'Australia e al Giappone per diciamo, la sicurezza e la stabilità dell'area Indo-Pacifica. L'Indo-Pacifico peraltro, come sappiamo, è un percorso da molte turbulenze a partire dalla eh, questione di Taiwan e della tendenza egemonica che la Cina tende a realizzare nello spazio indo-pacifico e quindi il ruolo dell'India è un ruolo fondamentale. Una leadership meno diciamo, eh, premiata dal voto come è accaduto in queste elezioni sollecita naturalmente l'India a continuare ad essere un protagonista degli scenari internazionali, in particolare degli scenari indo-pacifici, ma mi pare anche da questo punto di vista impone una, uh, una attenta valutazione uh, a Modi e a chi governerà l'India. C'è poi il grande tema dello sviluppo economico e dello sviluppo sociale, perché non c'è dubbio che l'India ha avuto in questi anni un grande sviluppo economico, una, politica, una politica di modernizzazione sia sul piano infrastrutturale, sul piano della riduzione diciamo, degli assetti burocratici, sulla snellimento di tutta una serie di aspetti che hanno reso il paese più dinamico e questo si è visto anche nei tassi di crescita. L'India continua a essere un paese che conosce una crescita del PIL che sta tra il 7 e il 10% a seconda degli anni. Eh, però tutto questo eh, come dire, mette in luce la questione sociale, e cioè alla crescita economica, alla forza del PIL, alla potenza, diciamo, globale dell'India eh, non è corrisposto più di tanto una riduzione delle disparità e delle disuguaglianze sociali e questo è un tallone d'Achille molto forte e nel momento in cui il governo sarà un governo di coalizione non un governo diciamo a maggioranza soltanto del partito dei Modi e nel momento in cui l'opposizione dopo questo voto è molto più forte e Gandhi si è caratterizzato molto nella campagna elettorale sui temi sociali, sul tema della lotta alla povertà, questo è un nuovo fronte che obbligherà Modi a misurarsi con questo tema più di quanto non abbia fatto, più di quanto non abbia fatto fin qui. Altra questione è la questione della, diciamo, 
attitudine, forse questa parola è un po' forte ma ci capiamo, è l'attitudine autocratica che Modi ha sviluppato in questi anni, in particolare nel controllo dei media, eh, nell'aver diciamo, inasprito una serie di eh, aspetti di controllo e di ordine pubblico, nell'aver fortemente caratterizzato in termini oppressivi lo scontro con l'opposizione eh, e insomma tutto il tema della tutela delle garanzie dei diritti di uno Stato democratico ovviamente non è venuto meno, l'India continua a essere un grande paese democratico però con la gestione Modi si è vista una diciamo, tentazione, usiamo questa parola una tentazione autocratica eh, molto pericolosa l'esito elettorale in qualche modo mette anche questo, mette un, come dire, un warning a Modi, cioè nelle ragioni che hanno portato l'elettorato indiano a non premiare Modi e il suo partito, c'è cioè da un lato il rifiuto, come ho detto all'inizio, diciamo dell'enfasi dell'identità dell hindu, ma c'è anche secondo me il fatto che quella tentazione autocratica ha preoccupato e spaventato una parte della opinione pubblica che nel voto ha dato un voto, un segnale molto chiaro di non voler vivere in un paese che mette a rischio fondamentali diritti e standard democratici, ecco. e a partire dal rispetto delle minoranze, tutto il rapporto complicato con i musulmani, eh, la libertà dei media, l'indipendenza della magistratura, cioè ci sono una serie di aspetti eh, abbastanza delicati su cui Modi si è caratterizzato con una tentazione autocratica e il voto in qualche modo diciamo, rappresenta anche un, 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 diciamo, un warning che l'elettorato ha dato eh, a Modi. Quindi direi che queste sono grosso modo le questioni che stanno da fronte all'India di oggi. L'India è un grande player, continuerà a esserlo naturalmente, è un grande player della globalizzazione, è uno dei quei grandi paesi che segna con la sua forza economica, la sua presenza politica, eh, la, sua, eh, la sua storia, la sua cultura, eh, il mondo di oggi. Eh, sarà così anche con un governo di coalizione, non più con un governo monocolore. Tuttavia, quel governo di coalizione dovrà fare i conti di più con le domande della società indiana, con un'opposizione più forte, con le ansie e le preoccupazioni di un paese che non vuole vivere in una società in cui i diritti e gli standard democratici siano ristretti, insomma, si imporrà in qualche modo a Modi e vedremo se lo farà. Il voto dovrebbe imporre diciamo, una verifica, una revisione degli aspetti, no, dei, dei caratteri, del profilo della politica che Modi segue e tuttavia poi si vedrà. Naturalmente per un paese come l'Italia quello che accadrà in India è importantissimo perché le relazioni tra noi e l'India sono via via cresciute sempre di più. È importantissimo naturalmente il rapporto tra l'India e l'Unione Europea. Nell'ambito della dimensione globale eh, questo rapporto è un rapporto fondamentale e, e quindi io penso che abbiamo tutto il dovere di seguire l'evoluzione di politica ed economica indiana sapendo che con l'India bisogna fare i conti e bisogna fare i conti con un grande player del mondo, del mondo globale. Qui mi fermo e ringrazio tutti voi di questa, il CESPI, di questa eh, giornata di discussione, ringrazio Lugarese, ringrazio tutti eh, i nostri amici e i nostri ospiti e naturalmente, come eh, sapete, questo nostro appuntamento, che ha tratto ovviamente spunto dalle elezioni, però si colloca dentro una scelta che il CESPI ha fatto, che è quella di dedicare all'India una permanente eh, attenzione eh, con un osservatorio e con politiche e con un'attività di ricerca, di analisi e di confronto che, che ci consenta di conoscere meglio la realtà indiana, di farla conoscere in Italia molto di più di quanto non si conosca e di concorrere così, insieme a tanti altri, a delle relazioni sempre più intense tra l'Italia e l'India e l'Europa e l'India. Grazie. Thank you, President. So we, we are all here because we are all uh, fascinated by India and uh, 
the topic as uh, elections in politics may have raised some passion, but uh, the at the end we have the there is our deep interest in understanding what's happening in this big country. It's not just, uh, uh, it, it, I, I don't think it has been just a meeting, uh, but uh, the establishment of relationship among uh, us and uh, that will continue. And we had uh, very many and very interesting suggestions on which, on which we will try to work in the next week, month, the political development is very important. The cast, the how the caste based political system will evolve. The interaction between the government and the opposition, the economic model that includes so many issues, and it's very important. Will deserve uh, a, a lot of, of 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 analysis. And then the foreign policy, of course, has been. Uh, that uh, and uh, will will attract a lot of our attention. I thank all of you. First of all, the, the speakers, the participants. First of all, the our Indian guests, uh, but everybody who joined the meeting. And I hope it has been useful. And uh, I hope to see you again in the future. Thank you, and have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.